wanna dash, wanna go fast, wanna be brave, wanna move like an assassin. Just to be frank, it's not for the faint of heart. And the only question left is where do we start? Guys, what is up? Welcome to the Ask Sean Show, where once a week I sit down, I answer your questions. Anything, business, life, sex, money, politics, religion, anything goes here on the Ask Sean Show. Welcome. All right, Shad, good question. Uh, What keeps people stuck? Uh, People keep themselves stuck. Uh, I have spoken to thousands and thousands of people around the world and I have asked people over and over and over the same question like, have you failed? And most everybody has failed. And in fact, most people will raise both their hands and be like, I failed a ton. So people aren't afraid of failing. What people are deathly afraid of that I have found is that people are deathly afraid of being judged. And what keeps people stuck is the fear of judgment. Well, what if this business doesn't work? Or what if this doesn't work? Or what if I try this diet and I'm still fat or whatever, whatever. People are deathly afraid of being judged. We've all failed before many, many, many times. We've become experts in failing. So we're not afraid of that. But what we're, what we're deathly afraid of is that something doesn't work, the idea doesn't work, the business doesn't work, and people are going to laugh at us, they're going to mock us, they're going to judge us, they're going to say, I told you so. And that's what keeps most people stuck. The truth is, if you start something and you, and you fall down, not a problem. But you're going to worry about the people judging you more than anything else. That's what keeps people stuck. <music> Kelly... The biggest move that you can do right out of the gates is make more money. Just straight up make more money. Scale your business, grow, learn new skill sets, uh, copy what's working, find out who, who is in the at the top of whatever industry you're in and copy what's put them there at the top. No, the number one quote unquote secret to, to the financial abundance and financial success is just making more money. Number two, you probably heard this 10,000 times. Spend less than you make. Spend less than you make. You would be surprised how hard that is for people. We get in debt way over our heads, way more than we can afford to keep up with the Joneses, to try and keep up the image, to try and fill a hole that we have that, 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 that isn't met by something else. And the reality is we're constantly chasing debt and we're constantly chasing our tails that way. Spend less than you make. If you can't buy it with cash other than a house or a car, don't buy it and just make more money. Charlotte, great question. Um, My answer might surprise you. I I don't believe in failure. The only way that I think a human being can quote unquote fail is if they don't recognize a lesson in something. So let's just assume you went bankrupt. Let's assume you lost millions of dollars. A lot of people would look at that as a a failure. I look at that and say, did you learn a lesson? Did you learn something about finances? Did you learn something about cash flow? Did you learn something about capitalism that you didn't know prior to going bankrupt? And the reality is, if you did, it's not a failure. It's an education. And so I've chosen to look back in life at at all of the quote unquote hard times, frustrating times, failures that people would otherwise say uh, were failures. My divorce, my personally losing millions of dollars, my bankruptcy. And I learned more going through bankruptcy about money, about cash flow, about business than I could have ever learned at an Ivy League school. I learned more about love and connection and honesty and relationships in going through a divorce than I probably would have ever learned staying married. So I don't look at anything in my past as a failure. I look at everything as an education and a lesson that I use to make my life and my future better. So if you're learning something, you're not failing. So I I challenge you to reframe all the hard times, all the things that you think are failures in your past and say, did I learn something from that? And if the answer is no, go even deeper. Like ask yourself even deeper questions like, am I just being prideful? Is my ego in the way? Because I guarantee you, if you look at most of the experiences that have the most value in life, they end up being the darkest ones. They end up being the hardest ones. They end up being the ones that, uh, that we, we, we really like went to the bottom of the barrel in. Those are typically the best experiences. Those are the most valuable learning experiences that we have. So I don't look at uh, anything in my life as a failure. I look at everything as a teaching and a learning experience. Corey, great question. All three have relevance, uh, word of mouth, social media, and paid advertising. What I always tell my clients uh, and what I tell people in the Lions Den and Lions Not Sheep is this, figure out who your avatar is and then put your product and or service in front of them. What a lot of people don't do is they don't know who their avatar is. And by avatar, I mean client. Um, 
if you're running ads to uh, uh, everybody who loves tea, but you're trying to sell coffee, you're putting your ad in front of the wrong people, right? So when it comes to paid ads or paid uh, uh, paid information that you put online running traditional marketing, whether it's billboards or media, you have to figure out where your people are. If all of your people are on the radio, but you're running TV ads, you're doing it wrong, right? And you can't ever go wrong with social media. You can't ever go wrong with social media. And here's why. Number one, it's free. And number two, it casts such a huge net out there that number one, you can run ads on social media to a direct target, to your avatar, but there's so much power in the organic traffic in the organic movement of a message and of branding and of marketing. That's literally how I built and grown Lions Not Sheep is uh, 90% of our following, 90% of our movement came from organic, me posting day after day after day after day. Um, and then obviously you get word of mouth that way. So you get word of mouth if you're a good product, if you're a good service, if you're something people buy into, something people believe, people will constantly talk about those things when they had a great experience with a dinner or a server or a restaurant. They'll tell their friends, hey, you should go to this place, it's a good place. I bought a shirt here and I really like this shirt. So all three of them have very, very, very specific uh, objectives and outlines, but the number one thing that I tell business owners and specifically marketers is, figure out who your exact avatar is and then put your product or service in front of them. Uh, Jeffrey got a little political. What's the first thing I would do as president? Uh, I, I would uh, enact term limits. I don't know how I would do that. Executive order. I mean, we can just exact, uh, these presidents just executive order, whatever the hell they want nowadays. Anyways, term limits. I think term limits changes the entire game of politics in DC. You can't be there for 40 years. You can't build up a freaking war chest of all of your, your favorite rich friends, whatever, whatever. You got two terms. You come in, you do your civic duty, you get your ass out, you go home. Next, and we move citizens, average patriots, average Americans, through the leadership position and, and running this country. You can't stay aligned and have allegiance to uh, special interests there. Without question, the single biggest thing we can do for this country, the number one thing that I would do, the very first thing I would do as president of the United States of America is enact term limits. Peggy, uh, there aren't too many questions that like trigger me or bug me, but I get this question probably more than anything else and it boggles my mind. Like, the question is this, where do I start or how do I start? Like, it's so odd to me because I'm highly motivated. And I also realize that not a lot of people are, but like if, if you're sitting in life going, well, how do I start or where do I start? While you have literally a supercomputer in your hand, I don't know how to sell things online. I don't know how to get, build a six pack. I don't know how to freaking be a good dad. You literally have every answer to every question available on your phone right now. And so somebody that comes to somebody like me who's running successful businesses, who's married, who's a father, who's a leader, whatever, and you take the time to ask me the question of, well, how do I start or where do I start? It's mind bending to me. It's absolutely mind bending to me. I'll never, I'll never get, I'll never understand that question. Diana, great question. Um, this is a really hard one, especially as a business owner, as you're growing, as you're scaling, because you look at bringing somebody on as, as this expense. Um, what I challenge you to do is reframe that and look at it as an investment. Uh, my employees are investments. I don't look at them as, well, this person's gonna cost me this much or this much. I look at it and say, if I bring this person on my team, what will this person generate for me in revenue? What does, what's their capacity to make me and the company? If I lead them right, train them right, bring them up right, then, then they're going to be producing. Like every single one of your employees should be producing something for your company. And so as you contemplate, you know, how do we bring people on? I challenge you, don't look at bringing people on as this investment, or excuse me, as this cost, but look at them as an investment. So if you bring somebody on to do your books, that alleviates the time that you would be spending doing your books. If you bring somebody on to sell, that alleviates the time that you're out there selling and allows you to do what you're good at. I, I'm not good at a lot of things in my company, so I find people that are, and I task them to do certain things where I can then go spend my time in my zone of genius, if you will, which helps everybody grow. So it serves the, the, the best interest of the company for me to do what I'm good at, and for me to hire people to do what they're good at or what I'm not good at. So uh, my suggestion for you would be number one, reframe looking at employees as um, expenses and start looking at the, them as investments, figure out what you're really, really good at what you don't want to do and what somebody can do better than you and hire those people to do those jobs.